prosperous Mississippi River Valley in the crosshairs of a surprising menace. It would be like looking at Katrina three, four times in a row. A catastrophic event that resonates across 300,000 square miles. Maybe there are 10 million people in that area. Survivors left without water, power, or heat. Roads and bridges destroyed, making rescue efforts impossible. The losses would be really in the hundreds of billions of dollars. It's a scenario that could redefine disaster in America. Large-scale uh, damage would affect the entire United States and, to some extent, the entire world. But it's not a hurricane, nor a tornado, nor a raging flood. The natural disaster scientists most fear will strike the central U.S. is a massive earthquake in and around Memphis, Tennessee. the birthplace of rock and roll, the home of Elvis Presley, and some of the best barbecue in America. But this city also has a deep secret, hidden far below the Earth's surface, 40 miles to the northwest, is the New Madrid seismic zone, and it's highly active. We have about 200 earthquakes per year. Residents can't feel most of these earthquakes because they're small and occur miles below the surface. But eventually, they will, when the fault zone delivers a monster quake. You know, time is ticking. It's a danger most Memphis residents are largely unaware of, leaving them unprepared. I've heard of in California, of course. Not earthquakes in, in Tennessee, you know. If there's an earthquake, I'm getting the hell out of here. I mean, <laughs> I'm getting out of here. <laughs> Scientists warn the New Madrid zone is capable of unleashing a quake large enough to be felt from Louisiana to Canada. It would bury Memphis and devastate the entire region, including other major cities like St. Louis. This isn't your garden variety disaster. While this may sound extreme, massive earthquakes on the New Madrid fault zone have been occurring repeatedly over centuries, which is why scientists warn it will happen again. In fact, three of the most powerful earthquakes in U.S. history occurred here, near a small town called New Madrid, from December of 1811 to February of 1812, followed by over 1,000 aftershocks. We thought the world was coming to an end. These earthquakes were so powerful, they altered the course of the Mississippi River and turned a cypress forest into an 18,000-acre lake. Witnesses reported church bells ringing in Boston and window panes shattering in Charleston, all from the force of these earthquakes thousands of miles away. In 1811 and 1812, damage and fatalities were low because of the region's scarce population. If a similar series of quakes hit tomorrow, the results would be apocalyptic. To learn how a large earthquake can devastate a densely populated area, we must travel 1,800 miles west to Los Angeles, California, where it did happen in 1994. California's earthquake country, about three quarters of the national earthquake risk is located here in California. Most people think that risk is created entirely by the San Andreas Fault. But California's earthquakes don't always occur on the San Andreas. In fact, Southern California lies atop an intricate web of faults known as blind thrust faults. These are the faults that cause the mountains to go up and the valleys to go down. They underlie many of our urban centers and they can have quite large earthquakes on them. The community of Northridge, California, about 20 miles northwest of downtown Los Angeles, sits right above one of these blind thrust faults. We didn't know it was there before the earthquake happened. Eric Pearson, an emergency medical technician, didn't know it was there either when he and his wife moved into a six-building apartment complex called Northridge Meadows in December of 1993. The Pearsons are asleep in their third-floor apartment, while 11 miles below ground, a blind thrust fault breaks. The force instantly unleashes deadly seismic waves. That rupture propagates along the fault at very high speed. 
about somewhere between 6,000 and 7,000 miles per hour. Within seconds, the quake reaches Northridge Meadows. It seemed like an apocalypse at first. It seemed like the whole world was ending. The Pearson's apartment is tossed in every direction. Then, without warning, the Northridge Meadows complex falls a full story. It had a bunch of first floor parking garages with the apartments above. During the intense shaking, uh, the building basically collapsed on top of that first story. The Pearsons endure another 10 seconds of shaking until finally the ground rests. That's all I heard forever was car alarms and people screaming. Um, you can hear people next door, down below, across the way. I'm just thinking the whole valley's been destroyed. The Pearsons know their apartment could collapse further any second. They must get out before an aftershock brings the entire building down. They quickly escape into the courtyard, but find a wall of rubble has sealed it off from the street. And the courtyard clearly isn't safe. So you can hear all the gas. You can hear it whistling out, and you can smell it. Other residents unknowingly set the stage for a lethal explosion. People are coming out, like I said, with candles that they can't find their flashlights. I was screaming at the top of my lungs at these people to put out the candles, screaming at them that the gas is on, the gas is on. Someone tells them how to shut off the building's gas supply, averting disaster. The minutes pass, and no help arrives. Pearson's terror begins to mount. But Pearson isn't concerned only with his life. He's worried about his neighbors who might be trapped in the building. Knowing they would be killed in an aftershock, he risks his own life to search for them. Jumping into people's apartments, crawling over cars, going into people's rooms, asking if anybody needed help. He heads down a tiny crawl space where he discovers a young woman. She was laying on a king-size bed face down with a beam on her back. And she was, um, you know, moaning and, you know, asking for help. With no room to maneuver, Pearson can't lift the beam. And we crawled in there and we told her, you know, hold on. Just then, Pearson hears a growing rumble. It's an aftershock. And he's still inside the crawl space. But Pearson realizes he's this woman's only hope for survival. He goes back in. I crawled in there to check on her, and she wasn't talking. And I couldn't tell if she was breathing. I couldn't get in close enough to her. But she wasn't moaning or saying anything. Pearson sadly realizes she is dead. This is one person he won't have the chance to save. Hearing no further calls for help, Pearson returns to the courtyard and begins trying to break out of the building. We found a space between a couple of the buildings that had crushed together about three or four feet in diameter. This guy that was with me got out that way, and he took off down the alleyway. Rescuers finally find them more than two hours after the quake. Ironically, the damage to Northridge Meadows had been so severe, it was imperceptible. The front facing the street had fallen so perfectly straight down and right on to the second story bottom level that it looked like a two-story apartment complex. Nobody knew it was a third story. 16 people lost their lives in the complex, though perhaps more would have died without Eric Pearson's help. There is no decision-making process. You either do it or you don't. I just learned that if something happens, you know, I can handle it. That day, 33 people were killed, 9,000 injured, and 20,000 left homeless by the Northridge earthquake. Earthquakes in urban areas can be destructive, not only in terms of loss of human life and, and injuries, but the economic losses are increasing as our urban centers become denser uh, with large structures. With $40 billion in damage, the Northridge earthquake was the costliest in US history. But it measured only 6.7 in magnitude and struck a city that's well prepared for earthquakes. In the New Madrid seismic zone, experts fear not one, but a series of larger quakes in an area that's much less prepared. While many of California's buildings are designed to withstand multiple earthquakes, those in Memphis aren't. We just haven't built to resist the effects of earthquakes. To make matters worse, in the central US, seismic waves travel much farther than they do in California. Compared to California, 
It's a hard, cold, deep, continuous slab that allows energy to travel great distances. Typically, we can expect about 20 times greater area of damage than you would see in, say, California from the same size earthquake. Up next, how a new Madrid quake would change the way America views disaster. If you get in there trying to restore order, and then you're faced with another event and another. A massive earthquake could destroy mid-America. If residents find this hard to believe, they wouldn't be the first. As a geologist, I think I was skeptical when I started working here in 1997 until I saw a catalog of 4,000 earthquakes that have occurred since 1976. That averages out to 200 earthquakes a year. Fortunately, these earthquakes are small, but scientists estimate there's as much as a 40% chance the region will be hit by massive quakes again within the next 50 years. All of these earthquakes, big and small, occurred in the New Madrid Fault Zone. And this part of North America was being stretched apart, pulled apart by plate tectonic forces. Over tens of millions of years, this caused cracks to form across the North American plate, creating a major rift now known as the New Madrid Seismic Zone. Had that rift in the Earth's crust been completely successful, we'd have a new ocean here. That depression was filled by sand and clay from rivers and oceans over the eons. Though the rift is now covered by sediment, the massive dent in the Earth's crust is still there, posing an extraordinary danger to Memphis. Those ancient cracks are now being squeezed by modern plate tectonic forces, causing our today's earthquakes. Scientists are studying these earthquakes to try to predict the magnitude of future quakes. But because the faults in this seismic zone are buried so far underground, they face huge obstacles. After an earthquake, in many places, you can take a tape measure and measure how much the fault moved. That's, that's a pivotal piece of information. We can't do that here. Everything is very deep. It's a very uh, distorted picture. When they rupture, scientists fear the New Madrid faults will produce not just one, but a series of large earthquakes. They seem to go off big. There seem to be several, if not multiple, uh, tens of events. And experts fear it could suddenly happen one quiet afternoon. p.m. Memphis, a seemingly ordinary brisk winter afternoon. Graceland is packed with visitors. Residents finish up their lunches, and thousands of children anxiously count down the minutes till school lets out. But this is no ordinary afternoon. 40 miles up the Mississippi River and two miles below the basin, the fault on the southern end of the New Madrid seismic zone ruptures. It unleashes a magnitude 7.4 earthquake. Seismic waves lash out from the quake's epicenter at 7,000 miles per hour. They make the 40-mile journey to downtown Memphis in 18 seconds. And you don't have time to be afraid. The ground begins to shake, causing tall buildings in downtown Memphis to sway. Large fissures open up in the streets and erupt with sand, coal, and flashes of light. Memphis residents are immobilized by shock and fear. And I don't think we're going to react uh, as quickly as we need to. After a few seconds of shaking, only piles of bricks remain where buildings once stood. Of the 5,000 unreinforced masonry buildings, about three or 400 of them are school buildings. Thousands of children are trapped, injured, or dead. People inside their homes don't stand much more of a chance. 95% of the building stock in Memphis are wood frame houses. Most of them are not designed directly for seismic excitation. The thrusting earth wreaks havoc on Memphis neighborhoods, painting a disastrous scene. Whole areas of maybe two or 3,000 houses and not a single house standing. After 30 seconds of this violent shaking, the DeSoto Bridge buckles into the Mississippi, cutting off vital access to the city. Our ability to respond and recover could be compromised. But Memphis isn't the only city that feels the wrath of the quake's seismic waves. St. Louis sustains major damage, and cities as far away as Chicago are affected. 
Back in Memphis, the quake continues its unrelenting destruction. Pipelines that are buried in the ground would be uh, ruptured. Pipelines that are on the surface of the ground would be ruptured. Natural gas, oil, and sewage spew into the air. Electricity lines breaking and falling onto the, the ground, then they will create sparks, and this will actually create fires. The quake finally stops, but the fires have just begun. They feed off chemicals and natural gas, spreading quickly through the city. Survivors wander through a burning wasteland, while emergency workers desperately try to control the flames. Then you want to extinguish them, but there is no pressure in the water pipeline. Night falls in Memphis, but the city still glows orange with fire. A catastrophe not just for Memphis, but the entire Northeast. About 40% of the natural gas that feeds New England came in and around the New Madrid seismic zone from the Gulf Coast. After seven unrelenting days, relief workers finally managed to put out the fires, tend to the most severe medical emergencies, and evacuate parts of the city. Then, the unthinkable happens. Another violent earthquake, even larger than the first, this monstrous quake brings down almost every structure left standing. It will look like uh, an area hit by a nuclear explosion. In the end, thousands of people are dead. Hundreds of thousands are injured. Economic costs soar over $100 billion. It would affect absolutely everything across the world. It's a disaster of epic proportions forever changing America's perception of catastrophe. Plans just have not addressed that scale of disaster. We've never been faced with that kind of disaster. Up next, bracing for catastrophe. Will Memphis be prepared in time? As far as we've come, it's only the tip of the iceberg. I've traveled every... Scientists warn the threat to Memphis is undeniable. An earthquake will one day ravage the city and its surrounding areas. The clock is ticking, and officials are rushing to get the city prepared. We can't put it off. Every day we're working towards uh, addressing this hazard. We have a lot of infrastructure here, buildings, bridges, pipelines, that are vulnerable to the effects of shaking from an earthquake. In 2000, Memphis embarked on its most ambitious retrofit so far of the DeSoto Bridge that carries three interstates across the Mississippi into Memphis. But this $170 million project is already two years behind schedule due to a lack of funding. Officials are struggling to decide how best to spend the rest of the limited funds available for retrofits. The most important bridge to retrofit is not necessarily the one that gets the largest average daily traffic. It could be one that's uh, in another part of the city that's next to uh, some very critical facilities uh, that the emergency management needs to uh, have access to after an event. The decisions require a level of understanding of the Memphis infrastructure that doesn't currently exist. However, at the Mid-America Earthquake Center in Champaign, Illinois, Jerome Hajar and his colleagues are working to fix that problem. We've been developing software that can do regional loss assessment and decision making uh, to help prioritize how we retrofit. The software uses aerial photography in combination with data that predicts how buildings will react in an earthquake to pinpoint critical structures that must be protected. As far as we've come, it's only the tip of the iceberg. The system may not be completely ready for another two to three years, and it could be decades before all the necessary retrofits are finished. In the meantime, Mid-America needs a response plan to mitigate the effects of a major quake. Jim Wilkinson heads up the organization dedicated to developing that plan, the Central United States Earthquake Consortium, or CUSAC. So in order to look at these types of catastrophic disasters, we've got to go sort of beyond the norm. CUSAC is organizing a post-disaster strategy that would pool the resources of FEMA and eight states across the region. But the power of the New Madrid fault zone poses tremendous challenges. If you've got six and seven states that have been impacted, uh, each of those states can be demanding the same resources, demanding the same aid. Um, how do you control that? How do you interact with those states uh, with you know, limited resources to meet their needs? Officials can only hope they have enough time to prepare the region for a major quake. Meanwhile, residents must also be able to protect themselves. Up next, 
how to protect yourself in an earthquake. When an earthquake strikes mid-America, there will be no time for evacuation. No sirens warning residents to take shelter. There won't be a second to hesitate. Earthquakes happen without warning. You have to have a plan, and you have to work your plan immediately. If you're indoors, get under a sturdy piece of furniture, like a desk or table, to protect yourself from falling objects. If you're outside, get to an open area. Don't take shelter near the side of a building where you could be hit by debris. Establish a place for your family to meet after the quake, since normal communication lines will be unavailable. And don't live in denial, thinking it can't happen to you. The threat is real. Well, this is not stuff that's made up. The threat is now. The earthquake will happen. It could happen tomorrow.